All right, so um, this next piece is kind of a special thing that I had uh, really sought out, and I'm really happy we have here. Um, it's a panel to discuss some of the legal issues that might arise and may be arising in both AR and VR and other kinds of immersive arts. It's a very much uh, emergent area of intellectual property law, and I think it's something that uh, we all need to think about and also figure out how to contribute to as we figure out more creatively how to tell the stories that we want to um, and how to share them as widely as possible. So with that, I'll leave it to these guys. Please introduce yourselves. Check. Please. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much, Peter, for having us both on this panel. We're really delighted and honored to be here, um, part of this conversation. My name is Zahra Saeed. I teach copyright law and torts at the University of Washington School of Law. Before law school, I went uh, to uh, graduate school in literature. And so much of my engagement with copyright issues has to do with narrative and reading and uh, modes of engaging with different kinds of textuality. And I'm Jack Lerner. I teach at the UC Irvine School of Law in Irvine, California. And uh, uh, I run a law clinic there called the UCI Intellectual Property Arts and Technology Clinic. And we work with artists, filmmakers, authors, and others on areas related to on, on issues related to the intersection between law, technology, and the public interest. And uh, I've known Peter for many years, and um, one of the things we did that I'm most proud of is we achieved an exemption to the copyright laws that allows uh, uh, any author that wants to create a multimedia ebook to access material that's encrypted from DVDs, Blu-ray, and online media, which normally is against the law, uh, for use in their multimedia ebook. Uh, and so that's something I've been um, involved with for a number of years. And, um, and in general, thinking about authors using technology to tell stories, uh, or filmmakers using technologies to tell stories in new ways is, I think, an incredibly important phenomenon. Um, and that's why I feel very privileged to be here um, with all of you. So we thought it would be helpful to start by quickly defining virtual versus augmented reality as we understand them. Um, virtual reality has to do with technologies that facilitate a total sensory immersion in another world, an alternative world, maybe a simulated world, a world that doesn't necessarily need to borrow, say, the laws of gravity or the laws of our physical space. Um, it, uh, Second Life is the one that uh, maybe jumps out in the olden days, and now it's there are a lot of virtual world. Yeah. Pardon. More of a virtual a world. A virtual yeah. world. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll talk more in more granular fashion uh, about examples of that later. Uh, augmented reality, on the other hand, uh, is a technology that adds digital content to our experience of the existing physical world. It's kind of a mapping or an overlay. So one of the most mainstream uses of that that people have seen if they watch the NFL is the line of scrimmage and the first down lines, right? That's an example of something that's being mapped through uh, digital technology onto the existing world. Uh, one way that uh, the tech hype uh, describes this is as making the world clickable uh, around you. Now, the reason why it's important to distinguish between these two forms of technology uh, or sort of general buckets of, of technological tools is that copyright is at times frustratingly technical, right? Hyper-technical, some might even say. And the form of the particular technological use sometimes matters, right? And that's partly because copyright law has been pushed by new technologies to jerry-rig solutions um, where the new technologies didn't seem to map onto what copyright uh, was doing uh, in a print era. Uh, and therefore, uh, and again, to our frustration at times, we have to look closely at what the technology is particularly doing. So if you think about Google Glass, there's nothing about Google Glass that copyright cares about if all you're doing is looking through uh, uh, glasses at something. But the moment you turn on a recording uh, of that, you're starting to get towards uh, a, a possible infringement. The moment you start displaying what you're seeing on a screen for somebody else, right? Um, or uh, the moment when you start to make alterations through some kind of uh, looking device and, and mapping onto somebody else's 
uh, property, right now you're starting to uh, potentially approach a violation of the derivative work right. So the particular form uh, matters, even though to non-lawyers and to artists and engineers, it often feels like technical hair splitting, right? Like why, do you, why does that particular uh, technological distinction matter? And the other factor is it doesn't it doesn't map very well, right? And one of the thesis, the themes of our talk today is that copyright is a square peg, in not just a round hole, a perennially a hole whose shape is perennially shifting and is never going to be square and has never been square. A shape that also shifts in the eye of the court. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. So let's talk about what we're not talking about just for a moment. We're not talking about the huge number of potential legal issues outside of copyright that these technologies implicate. So in July, when Pokemon Go went live, uh, the, the talk du jour was about trespass and whether uh, various kinds of torts, which are civil wrongdoings, right, things like nuisance or things like products liability or things like the law of accidents generally, whether those kinds of claims could be brought against uh, the makers of the game, Niantic and uh, uh, Pokemon and Nintendo, um, for the behavior of their users. And part of the problem with those cases is that um, the users are warned very explicitly. At, how many of you have used Pokemon Go just as a... Okay, so maybe smaller than I thought, um, uh, right? But the users are warned not to do dumb stuff, and they keep doing <laughs> dumb stuff, right? And so, uh, but those things, in our view, were less central to uh, storytelling, right? And so, for instance, the, poke, the, the patent uh, case law in the area around virtual technologies, we're not discussing that. We're not even talking about trademark, although we could in the Q&A because there's some interesting stuff there. And yeah. you want to talk about privacy. Yeah, and I mean another area that, that I think is a little more relevant than the, than the sort of nuisance or trespass and stuff that's been raised by Pokemon Go is privacy law, right? And so Pokemon actually, did an, earlier, um, an earlier version actually had a really um, big privacy problem because it was giving the, the app access to the, all of uh, the Google products of the, of the account associated with Pokemon Go. And this raised a lot of outrage because it was giving access to a lot more information than it needed. Again, that's not something we're going to talk about because it doesn't relate as much to storytelling as some of these more central issues around copyright, um, design, and uh, uh, and so and so. You know, we're we're flagging these issues for you, but we're not going to be getting uh, into 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 privacy or products liability except for just this just this note. So let's start to talk about some of the issues that arise around copyright. And as we head into talking about um, copyright as it maps onto or doesn't map very well onto some of these technologies, uh, Jack and I want to be really clear that there are kind of two postures when you are thinking about using intellectual property law. And, and one is, as a creator, what are you going to be able to protect? So if you create some kind of a, a technology that creates a virtual world or a virtual experience, and then you discover that somebody else has created one after having seen and played with yours that looks a lot like yours, right? What are your, uh, what's your ability or what are your rights going to be to go after that person um, using something like copyright law? So that's one of the ways that um, it will uh, potentially be present in your thinking as a storyteller. And then the second is um, thinking about what happens when you yourself are targeted uh, for um, the same kind of behavior, possibly copying, or uh, um, also having users be uh, engaging in behavior that creates liability. Um, so in the backdrop of that, I want to say that there are a lot of complicated issues that copyright doesn't have a, a great handle on um, with respect to some of the things that have to do with um, virtual and uh, augmented realities. The first is user experience. There's a lot of confusion around how to protect user experience. In theory, user experience is outside of copyright law, and in my view, properly so, um, because most of the best parts of a user experience are functional, they're useful. And copyright expressly says, hey, utility stuff, you go and patent, right? We're talking about expressive, artistic, pleasurable, the kinds of aspects that aren't about whether they work well or not, right? So the case law is pretty clear about that, except that uh, the case law evolved in an era before, uh, you know, in a single word, Apple, right? <laughs> before products sold um, partly as a, a function of how well the aesthetic and the useful uh, 
pieces merge. So you've seen a lot of things play, a lot of cases play out in this space where courts struggle with whether copyright's the proper place to protect something, whether trade dress should protect something, whether a design patent should protect something. So I think this question will be no different as applied to a virtual uh, experience or to a world that is created. Do you want to weigh in at all? Yeah, I just want to put on my law professor hat for a second and point out that you know, a fundamental thing about copyright that not everyone understands, um, even people who do it for a living, uh, people, for example, in the entertainment business, um, ideas are not protectable in copyright. And that's why we can have Beat Street, and we can have Break-In, and then we can have Break-In to Electric Boogaloo. Um, and, uh, and, you know, these don't infringe on each other, even though they have a very similar storyline, right? Ideas are not expressible, uh, protectable only um, original expression, right? Same thing with facts and figures. Any fact in the world, yeah. not protectable. Um, uh, as well as facts in fictional worlds, which Zara's gonna talk about in just, uh, just two seconds. Uh, the recipes, instructions, not protectable. Formulas, not protectable. The phone book, even if it costs millions of dollars to put together, not protectable. And the important uh, message there is that even if you have a copyright in something that you created, that doesn't mean that every aspect of it is protectable, right? So in, t in speaking with artists, they'll often say, but I copyrighted it. Well, first of all, the copyright uh, office uh, doesn't necessarily look closely when it grants um, copyright. So that's kind of one issue. But the second is, unlike with patent, where there's a rigorous screening process, the, b the barrier to getting a copyright is very low. And then we rely on a later stage to determine what actually was protected by the larger um, work that you claimed was under copyright. Now, uh, the second um, picture, the picture in the middle there, speaks to the principle that applied design is out of copyright. You don't have a copyright in something that's applied design. Now that is a case in which um, a designer had a cool looking modern sculpture and a friend of his pointed out, you know, that would actually work really well as a bike rack. Uh, and he went, oh really? Yeah, and yeah, if you just made a couple of changes. And so we made a couple of changes. It won an, a design award. And then when somebody copied him and he tried to say it's a sculpture, the court held that ultimately, no, you can't get protection in that because it's a really good bike rack. It works really well, right? And in fact, the design award was used as evidence against him, uh, right? So to the extent that something is functional, it's not going to be protected. And that idea about design is something that designers and artists often kind of struggle to understand as it applies to them, right? You have to look elsewhere for protection. Maybe trademark, maybe a design patent. And then as Jack alluded, um, fictional facts exist in a particular uh, category. Facts themselves not protected, right? So we can all write biographical accounts of, uh, you know, the 2016 election. Ugh, if we ever get past it, uh, right? We're all allowed to write the factual accounts of that. And any copyright in our historical uh, an analysis can be really thin copyright. Well, when you look at worlds that are created from scratch, that's different. And so courts will often say, well, you own everything that you created. J.K. Rowling owns everything in her world. The caveat here is, once again, you don't own everything in your work if some of what you uh, include in your work is either in the public domain or, and this is a really important one for designers to hear, if it belongs to a genre, right? So if you write about magical wizarding schools, your magical wizarding school account is going to include certain things that copyright calls sens affair. They're stock elements, characters. You're going to have a, a, a portly, jolly professor. You're going to have a stern professor. You're going to have, you know, uh, uniforms. My, fav my favorite example is the drunk Santa. Right. <laughs> uh, maybe not in the Harry Potter world, but um, <laughs> uh, right. Um, and, and that's why you know. It's just my own personal world. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see the VR version of that, um, right? And, and, and that's also why we have things like a zombie romance genre, right? Because if you could lock that up the first time, the, the first account of a, a zombie uh, love story, right, then subsequent ones couldn't happen. And so it's really important to understand that, again, even if you have a copyright in something, and even if you create it from scratch with a lot of hard work and so forth, if what you're doing is building a genre, contributing to a genre, within a genre, a lot of those things will be held out of copyright. Yeah, and the only thing I want to add to that is, you know, this case, what you see on the right is actually the Harry Potter lexicon, which was first a website and then a book. Uh, Warner Brothers sued and ultimately lost because the court said, you know, all this, this is no different than cultural criticism, right? You're talking about a work and you're ex helping explain and, 
and illuminate that work. And that's very different, and that's you know, fictional facts. And fictional facts, as we, Zara and I call it, are not, not protectable the same way that, that actual facts in the world aren't protectable. Um, and we'll talk a little bit, we might touch on a lexicon again later on, but I think the takeaway is that, you know, particularly in the U.S. with the First Amendment, you know, you, know you, you should be allowed and are allowed to talk about culture, right? And that might mean reproducing a lot of that culture in the process of actually exploring and illuminating it. And it's worth pointing out there that um, even in that case, the court was quite technical in the sense that it looked at the website and said, well, the website is fine. It's a fan website dedicated to uh, the whole Harry Potter world. And in fact, J.K. Rowling in her testimony admitted that she often used the website when she couldn't remember aspects about her own timeline or characters. But what was infringing was the work um, that was a book that was coming out the same year she had a book, a compendium. And so even there, copyright will say, well, it's not like it's sort of blanket ruling, it's we have to figure out precisely which uses lead to which outcomes. Okay, so I'll hand it off to you for our next. Yeah, and that's a, and a, and a great insight that I want to repeat that Zar brought to this, has brought to this conversation is that, you know, whether copyright is triggered often depends on the form of the interaction between the technology or the storytelling device and the world, right? And so it was fine when it was a website, suddenly it was a book and it wasn't fine anymore. Um, and that's a great example of how it just depends on the form. So uh, let's talk about authorship, right? Now authorship, uh, you know, everything is a remix, uh, uh, you know, everything is recursive, you know, the greatest artists are also the greatest thieves, yada, yada, yada. Um, copyright sees authorship, again, you know, um, uh, as anything that contributes original expression gets this temporary monopoly from the government um, that lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years or for 95 years if it's a company, right? And ultimately, you know, whether you can bring a suit, you, you need to be an author um, uh, or uh, someone who's acquired something from an author, right? Um, so the first thing to understand is, you know, if it's not fixed in a tangible medium, whether it's a hard drive or on paper or something like that, uh, it is not protected, right? So again, using Google Glass, you're, you're experiencing the world, you're layering all the stuff over the world. That probably doesn't implicate copyright, but as soon as you hit the record button, uh, then suddenly you're making copies of copyrighted material uh, in your environment, and, and, that, and copyright is triggered because it, it's, uh, it's fixed in a tangible form. Uh, it gets more complicated when you have joint authors, right? When you have multiple people contributing, and of course that happens all the time. So the law says, okay, well, first of all, there has to be some, you know, more than a minimal contribution. It has to be some, some significance, right? And, uh, uh, and so, you know, simply saying, hey, well, did you think about that? And then, and then leaving the room isn't going to work. But, uh, but you know, in, in the filmmaking context, for example, someone writes the score or, or someone, uh, you know, comes in and doctors the script and spends, you know, a week or three weeks or a month doing that, that might um, trigger joint authorship um, or at least be... Uh, uh, enough of a creative contribution. It has to be a creative contribution. You know, people laying tape, whatever, gaffers, or someone who, who checks all the spelling wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't count as a creative contribution, right? But then it gets much more complicated, right? So what about when you have an author, um, and the author gives the manuscript to an editor, and the editor spends a year working on that manuscript and, and has an incredibly profound effect on that? And the way the courts handle that is they say, look, we're not going to give the editor joint authorship in that work because both parties understood that the, that, the, that the person who wrote the actual manuscript and is, who's ultimately going to be out there uh, taking credit for it and defending it and whatever else uh, is, is who the party's intended to be the author, and we'll leave it at that. In the filmmaking context, you know, it's very difficult because you have many filmmaker, film projects that, that use tens or even hundreds of people involved in creating that film, and many of them make creative contributions. Now, in certain sectors of that world, uh, you, you know, you sign what's called a work made for hire agreement. So you, you have a contract that says, I agree that any contribution I make, you own the copyright to that, and I, and I never, I'm not transferring it to you, I never had a copyright in that. Um, and the law allows to do that in certain contexts, which we'll get to in a second. But um, there are a lot, you can't do that every time for, for a variety of reasons, you know, and particularly I work with a lot of documentary filmmakers, and when you're interviewing someone or you're filming somebody out on the street who does something creative or says something creative, you can't always get a release from them. And if you could, that would be, if you had to, that would be an incredibly profound uh, uh, 
chill on speech, right, and on the ability to make to make uh, to make films. Um, so what the what the courts have basically done there, uh, and this is a case involving a, a contributor to the Malcolm X film, the Spike Lee film. The courts basically said, uh, well, the mastermind or the producer or the director, um, usually you know, the person who's sort of orchestrating the whole thing is the one who's going to get that copyright. Um, and, and that's had some controversy, and we saw that. Uh, and this, this is a case that's you know, 15 or 20 years old, and we saw this in the Innocence of Muslims case where an actress was um, uh, uh, contributed five seconds of, of, you know, she was on the screen for five seconds in this terrible sort of anti-Islam Islam screed, uh, and um, the, the court said she has a protectable right in that five seconds of contribution that she made, and ultimately the, um, the entire Ninth Circuit had to overrule that, that panel and got together and said, no, it, it actually is the producer or the mastermind. Um, so, you know, obviously that's complex because you have a number of people um, um, you know, contributing and how, and how the law handles that is constantly uh, evolving, although the, the mastermind theory is more or less stable. Um, and then, you know, when you, when you involve um, a company or you're commissioning something, it's important to understand what constitutes a work made for hire and what doesn't, right? And so if I create something, if I am a script doctor, for example, um, or no, that's not a good example. Um, um, you know, if I, uh, the, the quintessential I'm commissioned to create a sculpture, right? That can't be a work made for hire unless I work for that company. Um, and that the law says that only, the only way that you know, the company or the person commissioning the work actually gets the rights to that work without having to get a license from the creator or the author is in two certain circumstances. So the first one is, are you an employee, right? And, and the Supreme Court has said, okay, well, to figure out whether someone's an employee, we're gonna look at nine factors, including how much skill it take, who brought the tools, where the work was done, who hired the assistants and the underlings, benefits, tax treatment, basically all the original incidents of employment. So if you're an employee of a company in copyright, the company gets the copyright, uh, in, in copyright law, the company gets the copyright and that's where it ends. Um, and so, you know, studio employees or newspaper employees, the company gets the copyright. But if you're not an employee, how can the company get the copyright and, and go on and do that? Well, f for one, that you can get a license, but that, but that's, that, the law doesn't treat that the same. Um, uh, and basically the court, the, the Congress has said, uh, if you want to get the work by contract and have it be a work made for hire, meaning, you know, I, the person commissioning it, owns the copyright from the start, there's only uh, eight categories of works, and they're like anthologies, motion pictures, translations, uh, a preface or an introduction to a work, uh, compilations, uh, textbooks, tests, answers, and atlases, right? And so there's just set category. Everything else, you have to get a license from someone, um, and then that person, one weird thing about the law and why, why people care about this is that that person can uh, can terminate that license 35 years later, whereas with a work for made for hire, they can't. And so one of the things that, uh, um, that we're working on right now in the, uh, in the UCI Intellectual Property Arts and Technology Clinic is helping people figure out how to terminate those rights when they, you know, for example, signed a publishing contract 35 years ago, the book's been out of print for 20 years, and they can get those rights back, right? You can't do that with a work made for hire. You can do that if you license the work. So I'm sorry I'm not, uh, um, I'm very, very, I'm getting very, very close to rambling territory, so I'm gonna, I wanna, um, I wanna uh, hit, the, hit the next slide. Since we have three case studies and yeah. seven minutes, let's maybe just do a really Yeah, quick and, so, and so, you know, I, I'm not really gonna talk about the machinima film movement, but many, have anyone heard of the machinima movement? Um, this, <clears throat> it's a very, it's a, it's a very challenging, issue for copyright because you're in an environment that, that is copyrighted, right? And, but you're creating new works. And so how that, it's a great example of how you know, copyright traditional notions of authorship are immediately challenged by something like this, where you're creating, you're using a, a, a virtual world or a game environment to create new art. Great, and uh, just a couple of quick examples. There are so many uh, to look at, but um, VR and storytelling have really kind of come into themselves in the past uh, few years, and you have um, uh, often the, the various filmmakers associated with this are connected in some way to the technology. So this is um, 
a screenshot of a movie, Henry, um, that was made uh, by the Story Studio, which is the filmmaking arm of Oculus, uh, and it won an Emmy, and it was the second VR film to win an Emmy. It's just a little short, uh, and it's, it's uh, super sweet. I've only seen little parts of it, uh, actually, but it's about a sad, lonely hedgehog who just wants to be hugged. Um, so speaking to Dan's point about um, empathy, right? Um, you, you follow him into his little den where he's sitting all by himself and he has no friends and he looks right at you, right? And, and viewers talk about the power of the, having that experience and <coughs> the story is about how his friends, the animal balloons, come to life and then he still can't, right? They're balloons, so with a hedgehog. Right? You can see the conflict, the narrative conflict. Um, anyhow, so that's w uh, one example. Uh, and then I love this example also because it's done by, by Dan. Where are you? Wave, wave your hand. If, yeah, this, this is awesome. So this is an example. <clears throat> I'll just uh, do a sentence of it or, or something. Maybe in the Q&A he can talk more about it. But um, <clears throat> excuse me, in which uh, Dan's company, Empathetic Media, um, created a, um, an app. Well, he showed it. To, is it ARC? Is that how you pronounce it? Arc stories, uh, and um, using stop signs in um, Sarajevo, uh, created a campaign to stop, right, there's the real world sign and the message, human trafficking, and to raise awareness about the millions of people who um, are trafficked uh, uh, in, in human trafficking every year. And you can see the power of the image, so uh, users could uh, use their phone and walk around the city and point it at stop signs. And actually, there were, they worked with Red Cross as well, um, with uh, volunteer guides walking around the city as well. So there's a human component, right? But what a powerful way to tell a story that blends advocacy and technology, um, layering digital tools over the environment um, around uh, users. So again, I'll, I'll stop there because he, you, you've got the, the maker of it in the audience. But it, a really inspiring use of technology, in my view. Keep going. So you know, what we did here was we put up a list of things that people preparing something, um, whether, it's a, whether it's an AR story, an ebook, or a film, might need to think about in the process of putting together that project. And particularly, you know, Zara and I have actually already been approached in this, uh, in, at this conference by people who are uh, thinking about uh, <clears throat> speaking truth to power and um, issues around, you know, Running, running up against you know their own lawyers saying you, you shouldn't you shouldn't name names you shouldn't speak truth to power because of the legal risks right and one of the big takeaways um, of today's today's presentation is that you know law can be used defensively and and law can be used offensively and both times in both directions there might be overreach and it's important to find people who understand the difference and also who understand the balance and who know how to do something and whose philosophy is to say here's how instead of no, right? Corporate I'm sorry? Corporate yeah, thank you. Um, and so, you know, here we see, okay, well, you know, you might want to secure rights uh, to life stories or adaptation, to, you know, to somebody's life story or an adaptation mm -hmm. of something. Um, you might um, need to hire people or retain people to help you. You might think about, well, I'm using copyrighted content without permission or payment. When is that okay? And that's the doctrine of fair use. Fair use often mm -hmm. allows you to do that, especially when you're doing criticism or commentary. Um, going out into the world and doing things we've talked about, thinking of then reviewing what you've done, right, and figuring out, well, am I, am I committing libel here? Am I, am I uh, you know, basically putting somebody's name in an ad and getting them in, 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 I'm getting in trouble for that? And finally, right, the, the, <clears throat> the last uh, one on the, on the bottom right there is preparing for the blowback. How do you speak truth to power? And the, and the answer is you can do it. You just have to have your ducks in a row, right? And that includes fact-checking, right, and making sure that when you make a factual statement, it's backed up. That includes getting insurance, and you can get insurance for e-books. And in, in our clinic, we've worked with a number of authors and artists and filmmakers who have gotten insurance, um, and that can, that can protect you as well. Having a public relations strategy so that you don't get rolled over, and there's an amazing and terrifying movie called uh, Big Boys Gone Bananas about how that happened to the filmmaker who made the film Bananas uh, about the Dole Company's uh, misdeeds in, uh, in, uh, in Central America. And one I didn't put up here and I forgot to and I should have put up is also in the corporate forum. You know, if you're gonna do something, uh, become an LLC. Now the reason we have this up here um, is because, you know, this is, is something that, uh, you know, any creator should be thinking about and particularly for an ambitious or, or large-scale project, right? But also, um, 
how does, you know, how does this layer to an augmented reality project, right? How has it changed with an augmented reality project? And, uh, and you know, is it different? In some ways it, it might be, in some ways it might not be, right? And so preparing for the blowback might be more complicated with an AR project, whereas the, um, or the, or the pro production part of it, where you have to figure out where you're going and, and maybe you don't know where, you're, where your subjects or the users of the product or the, or the readers are gonna be going, right? And uh, some other differences? Um, I, I just wanted to point out about fair use, uh, and it, thanks for putting together this really helpful checklist. Um, if you're in a community uh, as an artist, there is often a, a set of best practices, and there have been some wonderful best practices published by scholars working with practitioners. So look for those fair use best practices, documentary filmmakers, visual artists, and so forth. And those, so far, have been incredibly helpful in helping uh, artists not get sued. Yeah, and even if you're doing a project that doesn't, that doesn't directly fit into one of those categories, like maybe you are, uh, a vi uh, maybe you're an author, right, doing a nonfiction book, most of what's gonna be in the Statement of Best Practice and Fair Use for Documentary Filmmakers is actually gonna apply to that nonfiction work, right? So there's one on film for filmmakers, there's one for journalists, there's one for visual artists and museums and others in the art world, and there's one for online video, right, and remixes and, and the kind of stuff people put onto YouTube. The, the most important thing to know about fair use, in my view, is that there are a lot of myths about it, and if you talk to a lawyer who tells you it's totally unpredictable, it's the excuse to hire a lawyer, it's you know full-time employment for the copyright bar, right? Those are the old jokes about fair use. Um, and, and that's now empirically disproven. There's a lot of scholarship that shows that actually there are clusters of fair use happening in ways that are more and more predictable over the last couple of years. Yeah, and if you can get a lawyer to write a letter, you can get E&O insurance that will cover you. So that means the insurance company will pay for your legal fees, and if you were to lose, pay those damages, even if it's a fair use, you know, if you've got the right legal counsel that knows how to do that. And that leads us to our next point. I, I was telling Jack last night that I remember reading decades ago an article in Runner's World, back when I used to be a runner. And it was about how if you went to a doctor when you were injured and he told you or she told you, stop running, the answer would be, if you're a runner, go find another doctor who understands how much it hurts you not to run. And I think actually it's applicable here because you'll often have somebody tell you no at an early stage because of business risk fear, because of reasons that don't actually track copyright law. So copyright might ask for this level of protection and a publisher or somebody's media council might say, no, this is how much it protects and therefore your project can't go forward. So if you get that kind of response, get a second opinion. Uh, talk to uh, pro bono counsel in your community. There are lots of organizations that serve artists. Uh, contact a university, find a clinic, right? Um, because m many times um, business norms do not actually track what is required by law. There's a great, uh, a great line in an article in the Yale Law Journal from 2007, um, intellectual property's road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right, and that's, that's right. You know, if you are trying to be good and safe in IP, you may also be squelching the expressive rights of many people in the artistic community. Yeah, and you know, a great example is you'll see on TV, particularly reality television, logos being blurred out right and left. And so you're watching TV, there's all these logos blurred out. Most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time that's because people are uh, just afraid and they just don't wanna, you just don't want to deal with it, so we're just going to blur everything out, right? And uh, of course, it's just distracting and, um, and it's actually not necessary. And there's some other pretty good examples of, you know, of industry practices that are way more conservative than the law actually requires, and that has an effect on the ability to do what you want to do as a creator. So let me check one more slide. Yeah. So I think we'll skip this case study in the interest of time um, mm -hmm. so that we can have a more ro robust discussion. You know, but a great example of how copyright um, can run roughshod over legitimate expression is um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which makes it illegal to decrypt mm -hmm. from DVDs, Blu-rays, or anything that uh, any tech, to, to get, a, get around any um, technological measure that 
protects copyrighted content, right? And so, um, and so you know, here's Bobette Buster, mm -hmm. who, has, um, who has a very successful lecture series on, um, on storytelling in film. She wants to create an ebook and would not have been able to do that um, um, without getting this exemption. She had to go to the copyright office and endure an hour of, of um, grueling cross-examination by the copyright office in order to get it. A quick small story, and then we have a slide of takeaways that are in the manner of, of practical uh, advice. So my friend David Shields, uh, about two years ago, contacted me over the summer and said, I'm interested in writing a critique of the New York Times and its war coverage. And he said, I feel very personally uh, affected by what I've seen in their change in their coverage, the shift to color, all the rest, because my parents were journalists and we grew up with this as a family Bible. So all of the things we were talking about yesterday, right, the desire for self-actualization and expression and the ability to voice one, one's opinion, right, were at play in this work, which he ended up publishing. Well, along the way, we put him in touch with some good copyright counsel, which we, we feared that he might need, not because of the merits of copyright law, on which fair use is really clear, but because of the business norms. And sure enough, he got a cease and desist letter, and the first letter was about trademark law. And I said to him, you know, I think, that, I think actually they know what they're doing, because they didn't even raise the copyright issue. And then they talked to outside counsel and got a little bit, you know, a little bit uh, through some elbows and... Um, the, the moral of the story, although happily it's settled uh, now, is that it, so, sometimes it doesn't actually matter if you're right on the law, right, and you need to be protected. Um, and also that in this case, first of all, David had a hard time finding a publisher, even though he's got 15 or so books and he's made documentaries and he's you know, uh, achieved a, a, a fair measure of success, which generally means that he doesn't have a, too hard a time finding a publisher, but he did because they, were, they feared liability. First, second, um, it was a matter of his publisher's decision making whether or not to push for fair use or to basically throw David under the bus. It's kind of one, one way, in my opinion, of describing what happened, right? So there is this layer of middlemen that is sometimes ending up setting the level of copyrightability and how much copyright is going to protect, and therefore also gatekeeping. Right, what can get out there? Right, a critique of the New York Times war coverage, whatever you think of the New York Times, and I'm a reader, um, or its war coverage. Right, a critique ought to be able to surface. Right, um, so a small story uh, about the risks uh, inherent uh, for publishers yeah, and authors. And, and don't get me started on the New York Times withholding stories about warrantless wiretapping when they didn't need to. Okay. I won't get I won't get started on that because I'll never stop. So uh, you want to take us through this? Sure. Um, so this is what I call TLDL, too long, didn't listen. Um, and, you know, the first thing... And it's your last chance. <laughs> right here. Um, you know, again, the, you can use the law offensively or defensively, right? And so in other words, you know, um, m many people here are creating, you know, profoundly important works uh, and pushing the envelope of technology, and they're also creating copyrighted content. And I certainly believe that copyright has a role in, in, um, in ensuring that people are able to continue to do that. Um, at the same time, again, you know, often you know, publishers and, and, and many others will use that uh, a little too aggressively um, and, uh, and will also be more conservative than they need to be, right? And so striking the right balance is not only up to, uh, to that gatekeeper, it's also um, up to the creator, right? And, uh, and the person ultimately who is ultimately the author. Um, and, you know, I guess a corollary to that is, you know, find lawyers that understand what you do and understand how to say here's how rather than how to say no. Uh, you do this one. Um, so this is just this point again that often um, there's a tension in copyright case law or between, okay, uh, thank you, between um, the form of something and its function. And, and often courts will, uh, and there's, it, it kind of comes out different ways, but often there's the sense of, well, we don't actually care what it's supposed to be doing. We're just gonna look at technically, was a copy made or not, right? And so the tension between form and function um, leaves many innovators and artists kind of unclear about uh, what they're doing. And so when in doubt, embrace the most technical understanding you can of exactly what you're doing as it uh, lines up with, with uh, copyright law, which is often frustrating, right? It's not sort of commonsensical.
And so we talked a little bit about this already. You know, business practices and industry practices and norms are not the same as the law, and the law doesn't necessarily track those practices, nor should it, right? It's a little bit like if you back into your neighbor's driveway uh, regularly and uh, you don't ask them for permission, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something uh, unlawful happening every time you do that, right? Even if it's a technical trespass, right? But maybe you would ask permission just to be civil, right? Well, the, the process of asking for permission to be civil has led to a clearance culture and a permissions culture that now leads people to think that copyright law dictates it as opposed to good manners, right? And so just be aware of that distinction. And if somebody comes back to you and says, this is what we have to do, say, why? Right? If somebody ever tells you fair use is allowed if you only use 30 seconds or an eighth of the movie or none of that is true, right? It's just a sort of guide to like what's civil? What, what do we think uh, embraces the spirit of what copyright law would ask, right? But just be attentive to that. I think that's right. And finally, and this goes back to speaking truth to power and, and doing something that, that might be controversial, you know, I think the stance is be fearless and also be prepared, right? Find people who know how to do it, um, and there are people who know how to do it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, what you want to do is have your ducks in a row and make sure you've done the things you need to do, like forming an LLC or whatever, or whatever that may be. But ultimately, you know, the idea that, oh, we can't do it is, you know, in, in my philosophy as a lawyer, in my philosophy of lawyering is, is you know, there, try to help someone figure out how they can do it and, and, and empower them and enable them to do that rather than to say, you know, that's just not going to fly and, you know, you have to scrap the project or whatever it may be. And as part of that, you would be prepared to explain your artistic choices to that person, right? With fair use, it's often a question of, do you need that asset? Could you use any old asset to make that point? In which case, maybe there's not a good claim for it. Whereas, if you need that particular asset to make your point, make that clearer. And then fair use starts to really rise to the surface as a clear justification for what you're doing. And that's part of being prepared. I think that's an incredibly important point. Often we'll say to our clients, we don't understand what your fair use argument is here. This looks like you're using it just for the entertainment value. And the filmmaker or author will come back to us and say, no, actually, you know, this clip is something that you know, these brothers were watching every day for 10 years because it was the center of their whole philosophy. You know? And so we put it in there. And it's like, hey, add some context, and this is going to be a slam dunk fair use. Whereas, and, and you know, the way it ha the way it is now, people don't understand necessarily how to do it. Um, and I'd say, you know, um, another aspect of being prepared, and maybe this should have gone into the storytelling checklist, is educate yourself, right? And one way to start is there's a there's a paper out of American University Center for Media. Uh, society, m media, and social impact, and many of you have probably met or heard of Pat Arfterheide, who, who, who's the architect of that, um, and it's called Dangerous Docs, and it's about dangerous storytelling, really, um, and of course, that's where um, most of the statements of best practices have come out, so that's a great place to start as well. And finally, I want to ask one question, um, and this is just a straight-up nuts and bolts, this isn't even TLDL, and that is, has any, is, is who here has used or heard of Creative Commons? Okay, nearly all of you. If you haven't, Creative Commons is a nonprofit based here in SF that creates licenses people can attach to works that, are, uh, that allows you to use those works often um, for, for free, or always for free actually, under the, the licenses. And now billions of works have been licensed that way, so it's a great way to use content um, if you need it. Did we eat up our time for Q and A? Um, well, it's up to you. Okay. So lights, please again. Yeah. I'll turn them on myself. So okay, great. Um, thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll eat into our lunch a little bit, not too much, or questions. The question is, do I regard Wikimedia Commons as a reliable source for copyright information? Uh, so Wikimedia Commons has a lot of material that is uh, licensed. I, I generally do. Um, 
most of the, I mean, I, I you know, always have a skeptical eye, but most of the time when I look at, uh, when I look at the material, you know, there's, there's, there's often some information behind it. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, so I wouldn't say it's, you know, it's, it's foolproof. Um, certain other repositories like the Library of Congress are a little bit more well-researched um, and, have, and have a little bit more definitive um, information on, on those assets, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice place. I actually put some slides together last night for another project and I use Wikimedia Commons content, so. Oh, I hear, I hear stomachs grumbling. Is that a question or? <laughs> 